Hello and welcome, my name is Jason Baker and this is Integrum Retro. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to map joysticks to keyboard encoders. Let's get started. Shall we play a game? The hard way, Alan. Keyboard encoders come in many different flavors. This is a two-player keyboard encoder. Its job is to translate joystick movement and buttons to a keyboard. If you watched my previous video, I covered how I mapped a wireless controller to the RetroArch RetroPad. The real power of RetroArch is the fact that you can take any device and map it to a virtual RetroPad. So that it gives you consistency on what the actual emulators see. And then all you have to do is you can swap things out and the emulators really don't need to be reconfigured. So in this video, what we'll do is we're gonna cover a physical joystick mapping with buttons to that same RetroPad. But what's different here is none of these have the capability of actually talking to the computer, which is why we need a keyboard encoder. This is a picture of the keyboard encoder I have in my arcade cabinet. This is the Ultramark iPack 4. It's called an iPack 4 because it supports four players. You'll notice here that it's actually very nicely labeled. You can see here left, up, down, and then different switches representing the different buttons that can be attached, start coin, so on and so forth. So putting these together is actually quite easy. If you've ever wired speaker wire, then you've done something very similar. Basically, with a joystick, there's gonna be four different wires that you have to output, which represent up, down, left, and right. You take a wire from that joystick switch, and then you're gonna literally take a screwdriver, plug this into the hole, screw it back down, and that's going to establish the connection. When you move your joystick up, uh, or down, or left, or right, um, basically this encoder will know that some kind of movement has taken place. The same happens with your buttons and whatever other buttons that you've used for coins. Now, when you have all this wired together, there's actually a USB cable that comes from this cord and goes directly to your computer. So basically, your computer sees this as a keyboard. That's why it's called a keyboard encoder. Now, what our goal is, is if it's gonna be outputting keyboard commands, we need to map that to RetroArch. But to understand first how we're gonna do that, you probably have to understand what exactly is being output by the iPad controller. Well, let's go and take a look at the iPad software and I'll show you. When you first get your iPack, or if uh, your arcade builder has just left all the default settings, a lot of this will already be programmed for you. So notice here you actually get a picture of your physical iPad controller. It's a little small, so what you have to do, you have to just simply click on the circle, and you'll see here what pin is it that you're configuring. So this is one up, that means player one, joystick up. And so notice here that it's assigning this the up key, which is basically the up arrow. And you would expect if you go here to left, it's gonna be left, right, so on and so forth. Now where it gets a little weird is when we start getting into the buttons. So notice here that button one is going to be a, the left control key on my keyboard, button two is left alt, button three is space, and button four is left shift, so on and so forth. Now many of these providers who actually create these individual keyboard encoders actually use this pattern. So those are not just simply random keys on the keyboard, they're mapped very closely to the MAME emulator. The MAME emulator has been around the longest. In fact, when it first came out, it only supported keyboard support. And so they came up with a mapping mechanism to represent multiple players and pretty much people have stuck with it ever since. So it's kind of funny when you think about this legacy mapping, you know, your, your keyboard today is a result of the way typewriters were laid out. Now typewriters and keyboards, they're not efficiently laid out. I mean, they're not designed for speed or optimization. If you remember, typewriters used to have those big metal bars that would go up and they actually purposely made them poorly designed because people were typing so fast when the keys were laid out efficiently that the bars would actually intersect so the keys would get jammed. So they actually made it inefficient. And unfortunately, that's how keyboards are made today. They're made with the same physical inefficiency that typewriters were. And here we are with keyboard encoders with this maybe not the most optimum layout on uh, assignments, which I'm gonna be covering in some detail here in a little bit. So now let's go ahead and take the virtual world. Let's take a look at what it looks like in a cabinet. Here is my four player control panel. So I have internally an iPack controller. All these physical buttons and joysticks are wired to these various ports. 
So what we need to configure obviously is going to be uh, taken into consideration is going to be the up, down, left, right for all of the individual players and then the button numbers. How are these buttons physically mapped to the uh, controller here? Now most reputable and, and pretty decent um, arcade cabinet builders will map using this formula. If um, buttons 1, 2, and 3 were always going to be the first three, buttons 4, 5, and 6 will always be the lower three. Now you may ask yourself, well, why is that? That's because look at player 3 and player 4. In my arcade setup, they only have six buttons. And that's actually very common. I've seen it on some arcade cabinets where they only have four buttons. The reason being is, is when you get into three or four player games, most of the time they don't have that many buttons. So there's really no reason to drill more holes and buy more hardware and, and deal with that configuration. And so it was funny because I remember somebody told me when I was making my drive, they said, there's no way you'll make it plug and play for all the arcade cabinets out there because there's just too much variance in the button layouts. Well, there is, but you know, most of them, at least they have this foundation, which means I can get it 98% plug and play. So these last two buttons are typically button seven and button eight. So when you're looking here at the iPad controller, here's button seven and button eight. Um, there is a button physical seven and physical eight on each one of these. And so you can see that players uh, three and four here on the right are capable of eight buttons, even though my arcade cabinet only physically has six. So I could upgrade that later on. Now, something else to keep in mind, there's two other special buttons, and that's typically the start and the coin button. Uh, the start button, the coin button is used for obviously inserting coins for arcade games, but when you get into consoles and other types, uh, that's usually going to be the select button, which is most uh, like commonly found in, in most console configurations. Once we've physically connected our controllers to a keyboard encoder, what is RetroArch going to see them as? Well, RetroArch is going to map whatever um, uh, up and down directions uh, along with buttons. They're gonna map it in this order. This is the order unless you do something really funky. Um, so up, down, left, right for all of your joysticks. And if you just simply go in the order, um, going from button one through button eight, this is the default mapping that RetroArch is going to have. So you're gonna have button one will be A, two will be B, three will be X, and four is Y. Then you're gonna have button five and button six will be L1 and R1. Those usually represent the left and right bumper. So if you're used to an SNES controller um, or Xbox, and then button seven and eight is going to be L2 and R2, which represent the left trigger and the right trigger. And then of course there's the start and select button. Now, depending on the emulator, again, that might be start and coin or that might be start and actually select. This is gonna be very important. Um, this default layout is what I, where I start to disagree, and I also start to see a lot of cabinet builders deviate from what they should. And it's probably because they don't rely on RetroArch as their core underlying emulator. And that's what I do, so this is why I have done what I've done. Let me explain. On my arcade cabinet, I've left all the defaults, up, down, left, right, and that's fine. But button one, two, and three are gonna be A, B, and X. Button three, four, and five are going to be Y, L1, and R1. And of course, button seven and eight is L2 and R2, just like I showed you before. You're thinking, well, why does that matter? Well, let me explain here. So let me explain by showing you this video of me taking the default values of my hardware and going in order of the button order that it's laid out on a cab. And again, most cabinet builders and DIY wires are going to numerically assign their buttons in this order. So here I'm in the RetroArch configuration and I'm just gonna walk through a standard configuration for player one. And of course, I'm going to configure the D-pad up, down, left, and right. Notice I have to use the keyboard because RetroArch knows nothing about my controls. Then I'm just gonna go from left to right. Button one is A, button two is B, button three is X, button four, the second row is Y, and then the start and select. Those don't interfere with the numbers, right? Those are individual. And then continuing on, we're gonna have L1, which is gonna be button five, R1, button six, and then finally we have button seven and eight, if I have those. And so there you go. Now let's take a look at MAME, and this is why it's important. If you go into MAME, which is the most popular emulator, and you'll probably spend the most time, let's take a look at the default player one controls. So going through here, you can see up, down, left, right is covered, but now notice, Control, Alt, Space, Shift, Z, X, C, and V. That is important because I need to make sure that my controller is mapped with those key commands for those specific buttons.
I created this little chart to kind of help you understand this a little bit better on why this would be important. So remember, we have our physical buttons that are going to be mapped to the IPAC. Now, fortunately, the IPAC, again, it was pre-configured very closely to the actual MAME defaults. So up, down, left, right, and control, alt, space, shift, ZX, CV. You know, it sounds like we're at the eye doctor, right? <laughs> Remember, looking at the iPack, here is port one, switch one, or player one, switch one is left control, left alt for button two, space, shift, Z, X, C, V. All right, just like MAME. So that's great. Meaning if we were to just simply start up MAME and we plugged in our buttons accordingly, this would work out of the box for MAME games. All right. The other advantage is if you are going to be running MAME by itself, this keyboard encoder will work. If you're going to be running RetroArch, this will work as well if you kind of go in the order that I showed you. Because what RetroArch does is when it's working with um, when it's working with keyboard encoders, it actually sends or passes through those keys uh, mapped to each one of them. But all you're going to see in the RetroPad is the actual letters. And so you got to kind of make sure you get everything just right. If you don't do that, you're going to run into things like this. I actually do see a lot of arcade builders who do something like this. They decide to map buttons X, Y, and then A and B to the buttons 1 and 2, skipping 3, to, and 4 and 5. So 1, 2, 4, and 5 are going to be your primary four buttons. But remember how MAME has it ordered. MAME will use button 1 as A, button 2 as B, button 3 as X, button 4 as Y. You're going to have a very weird physical layout. Let me show you what I mean by this. If we were to take the X, Y, R1, L1, the X or the A, B, R2, and L2 and map these accordingly, they this is how they would map according to the different buttons. So 3, 4, 6, 5, 1, 2, 8, 7. That's not in order. And if MAME was configured to do things in order, you're going to have some very weird experiences. If you're not following, okay, follow this then. Let's take a look at a basic configuration for Street Fighter. Right? Street Fighter, the top three buttons are for weak, strong, and heavy punch. The bottom three buttons are for weak, strong, and heavy kick. Notice this is strictly in order. And notice the layout is by those defaults. Control, Alt, Space, Shift, Z, and X. Those are the orders that it expects your buttons to be in. Now, if you programmed it this way, right, where you've got the X, Y on top and the A, B on the bottom, this is how it's going to turn out. Instead of you're going to have one punch on the top, a short and heavy kick on the top, and then you're going to have to have a button seven uh, because you map that to the uh, the L1, uh, which should be lower. And so now you're using four of the top, two of the bottom. You've got two punches on the bottom. It's a, it's completely whacked out. But wait a minute. Does this example sound familiar? That's right. I showed you how to reconfigure your wireless controller to fix this. Let me give you another example. That method I showed you works really good with laying out MAME, but what about say something like a console, like Sega Genesis here? Notice Sega Genesis has a just, it's a simple three button controller going left to right with a D-pad up, down, left, and right. Now, if you take a look at the old way or that a lot of other uh, manufacturers or builders, I should say, are configuring this, they do this, right? A, B, X, Y. So top two is A, B, bottom two is X, Y. Well that really doesn't align too well with the first three buttons because take a look at retroarch a b x is how it would most likely be assigned the first three buttons but numbers one two and three well in your case here what's it going to look like it's going to be well let's see here according to abc you're going to have a b on top and c on the bottom i'll tell you one thing i'm kind of a purist and unless i'm actually connecting a usb version of a sega genesis controller if i'm doing the next best thing and playing this in my cabinet i would like the button layout to match properly so again, if you do the configuration I suggest, the A, B, X, Y, L1, R1, by default, RetroArch won't have to be changed. It's going to work with three button controllers. Take it a step further. It'll work with six button controllers. Again, A, B, X, Y, L1, R1, button one through six automatically can be mapped also to six button uh, configuration. So that gives you a huge swath of default configurations where you don't have to do the reconfiguring. So I like to keep the simple approach and do it right all the way from how my buttons are configured from the keyboard encoder in the first place. Now with this, hopefully you, you feel a little more convinced that starting with your button order in the proper manner 
is going to make more sense. So now there's one other consideration you have to think about. And that is, what are the default keyboard settings in MAME? This is where I actually have a personal conflict with the default settings of MAME because they're legacy. These are, again, these are really old settings that didn't mean much until we started getting into arcade cabinets especially. So let's take a look at this. I'd like to highlight here, notice player one, button one, and player one, button two. That's the control and the alt keys. Now imagine if you push one and two and if you could find a delete key, you'd, you'd issue a control alt delete. But also imagine if you hit a control X, a control S to save, a control O to open a file. Um, alt space bar will bring up a menu. Um, alt X, control W to close down a window. There are so many different potential key combinations, especially when you start to expand the number of potential keys that could be pushed, especially in an eight player game. Look over here, player three is a uh, right control. So when you see normal control, that means it's a left control. This is a right control. So player three with the combination of uh, button six on player one could cause a control X. So there's a lot of potential conflicts that could occur when people start smashing buttons, especially in the four player games. So what I decided to do was I said, okay, I'm going to change some of MAME's defaults. Now this really only applies uh, to MAME, but if you're gonna change it in MAME, that means you have to change your encoder. And that means you have your encoder changes for all of your, or actually just the retro pad itself. Here I've identified some keys that should be replaced. They're all here in blue. So I wanna get rid of all the control keys. So first notice here that I have replaced the multi, uh, I've replaced the con right control with multiply and the left control with the letter B because looking B was not being used by anybody. Uh, and then I also replaced the alt key in button two with the slash key, which is right to the left of the shift key on the keyboard. Now a couple of these others here, I've highlighted in yellow because even though my IPAC um, most of the keys are pre-mapped to MAME. I noticed that some of them were incorrect. Like for example, for player two, six, seven, and eight, do not map to HOU by default. So I had to go in there and change that. So now you're starting to think, hmm, a little bit of planning went involved. Let me give you a little bit of insight into how I came up to all of this. And there's also one other thing. Not only do you have keyboard shortcuts for MAME, you have keyboard shortcuts for RetroArch. And how do you make sure you don't conflict with those? Well, here, I'm gonna take you through that process next. Here's a multi-step process till I came with a very large spreadsheet. The first thing I said is, okay, let me go ahead and map out what are all the default keys for MAME. So second, I said, all right, what do I want to change MAME to be like? I'd like to make as few changes as possible. So you'll notice here, most of them stayed the same except for the player one, player two. I changed those out. We don't want those control and alt keys. They, they just make nothing but chaos when you got a bunch of friends over and everyone's smashing buttons. And then here we've got player three, um, button one. I re replaced that control button as well. And so I decided to just use the remainder of the keypads uh, in order to assign um, up to six buttons for player four. I, doubt we'd ever get to seven and eight. Okay, so there we go, that documented that. Well, now I need to document, well, what exactly does RetroArch use? Well, here's what RetroArch looks like. So RetroArch has the concept of hotkeys. When you're in the RetroArch software itself, or even if it's emulating a game, all of these hotkeys are potentially active. So that means you got an R, a P, H, M, N, F1 through F12, add minuses, L, O, F, all of this. And in fact, they do conflict with some of the main keys. But fortunately, there's something called a hot T. <laughs> there's a hot T and a hot key. There's a hot key toggle that you can configure to stop RetroArch from recognizing these single letters. Here we are in RetroArch. In order to configure a hotkey, so this way all of those other keys don't conflict with MAME, um, or actually any other emulator for that fact, uh, go in here to settings, go to input, and then just simply find hotkeys. And you'll notice here, there's something called hotkey enabled. What this means is if you push this key, then you can push the equivalent uh, quick key in order to do something. So say in this case here, uh, fast forward to space. So you may wonder, well, what key should I use, especially in an arcade cabinet? Well, here's what I suggest. You use the number five. The reason why I recommend number five is because all arcade cabinets usually will have a coin button. And that coin button always maps to five. That's the default number, usually for MAME. And 
it really doesn't interfere with anything if you insert coins. Like if you hit start, maybe it'll start the game. You didn't want to start the game. You wanted to queue something up. Um, but five is kind of the least disruptive. And so it's a little awkward when you're using your keyboard to work with, uh, with RetroArch, because now what I have to do, if I want to fast forward a game, I have to hold down the five key and then I can hit the space key. It's a little awkward, but you get used to it, especially if you're going to be utilizing this in a cabinet. It's a lifesaver and a necessity because you have to block all of these individual keys here. As you can see, the E, the F4, the F2, the F, uh, all of these need to be escaped. So this way you don't accidentally send those keys to the main emulator. So now that I have a way to block out all of the RetroArch hotkeys, now I can just simply look at all the potential keys that are available to me. So notice here what I've done is I've just simply added now, okay, what will all this map to RetroArch? Because when I'm in the RetroArch menu and it says, what would you like the value to be for A, B, X, or Y? Well, first of all, I know that button one is A, button two is B. It's a little hard to understand that from the RetroArch menu. So being able to map this and seeing what the keyboard equivalent is in a spreadsheet, super easy. Then finally, what maps to the iPad controller? So this way, now I know everything is in sync. Once you know you wanna change the default settings for uh, main player one, just load up any game uh, using the main core, hit the tab key to go in here, and then go to input general. So I remember I want to change as the example here, we're just going to change uh, player one, button one and two. So we, we wanted um, player one, uh, button one to be the letter B. And then of course here, button number two was going to be the slash key. Okay, good. Now there is one problem here. So that's pretty easy. Now the, the great thing here is, is this is good. This, our default settings will now be applied for every single game. I do wanna show you one little notion. If you have assigned your, um, your default RetroArch buttons before changing MAME, notice the problem here. It is saying B, Joy 1A. It's actually looking that as a key combination. I want the letter B or Joy 1A because again, I might, remember how I showed you in my videos, I play with both Xbox controllers and keyboard. So this is not going to allow me to play with my joystick if I'm just pushing Joy 1A. So I need to fix this. So if this happens to you, it did happen to me, let's, let me show you how to fix that part. So once you exit the emulator, those changes to MAME are going to be set and now it's time to fix them. So in your RetroArch directory, you want to go to the saves folder, go to MAME, and then go to CFG. And you're going to want to edit the default.cfg file. Notice here the default CFG is showing me what I've overridden according to the default MAME. And this is why I like you know, doing this within um, the MAME interface instead of RetroArch. This is pretty clear. I can see what I've done. I've overridden player one button one and player one button two. Now to fix this so it doesn't look as a key combination, but it can be an either or, just simply type in the word or in here. And so now that's going to say, okay, I will press button one if you give me the letter B or you press button one on your wireless joystick. Go ahead and save that. And then let's go back in. Now I'm gonna go into the main menu. When I go to, sorry, not input this machine. Well, first of all, input this machine. Notice that the default settings are now applied. It says B and slash. So uh, my defaults are being set and it's in either or. So now I can play with wireless joysticks. And so that's really one of the tricks on how I can play with wireless joysticks and keyboard at the same time because RetroArch can recognize keyboard commands and joysticks at the same time. Let's go ahead and summarize what we've learned so far. We now know how to map our physical joystick and buttons to our keyboard encoder. So it doesn't matter if it's an iPack 2, an Ultra, um, Ultra iPack, an iPack 4, um, a KeyWiz, they're pretty much all the same in concept. Next, what we have to do is we're mapping those inside of RetroArch. So we're going into the RetroArch configuration and we're setting those default values. So mapping whatever is being output by our controller into RetroArch. Now, sometimes we need to change that because sometimes uh, if we're using the defaults that MAME had configured. You're gonna go into your controller, you're gonna make those changes. Then once you map those to RetroArch, then uh, you can go ahead and change those default settings as I just showed you inside of MAME itself. So now the real question is, does this fix everything? Well, guess what? 98% of all the games work amazing on a joystick by just simply doing this configuration.
There are times though when you need a little bit more customization because the main developers didn't always get the button layout right. Here's an example. Let's take a look at MBA Jam. Now, notice here I have a control panel for MBA Jam and I really wanna call out a really cool website that you need to look at. So if you take a look at MAME Arcade Database, the very first link here is the arcadeitalia.net. I know it's crazy Italian, right? But yeah, it's, um, it's an incredible website. So here, if you wanna type in MBA Jam, and, and this is why you would do this, because you want details um, about some particular game, whether it's available or not. So let's do MBA Jam. And uh, we'll just do this one here, for example. And the great thing about this web, this database is it gives you all sorts of screenshots and gives you information about how many players, the types of inputs, what ROM set it was found in, what's the status in MAME itself, video uh, aspect ratios. And some of these pictures will also reveal the control panel. So this is how I was able to get and determine, wait a minute, I don't like the way this is being mapped in MAME, and MAME had it opposite of what it should be. And you'll see what the problem is. What MAME did for NBA Jam is they mapped button one to turbo, button two to shoot, and button three to pass and steal. Well, when you think about it, this is a three finger game. Your index and middle finger should be utilizing these two while, sorry, utilizing these two while this should be more of a thumb button. So this really should be a button three. This should be a button one, a button two, and then a button three. So the easiest thing to do is to actually go into MAME and fix the way MAME's default mapping for this game was. Because RetroArch didn't have it wrong, I felt that MAME should ma have made this button three. So let's take a look at that. Here we are in NBA Jam. So what I did here is I obviously hit the tab key. Now let's go ahead and just change the shader here and uh, make it a little bit more visible for the recording. Okay, we'll work with this here. Okay, so instead of input general, obviously I'm going to modify just this machine. So I went into this machine and then I just simply changed turbo, right? Turbo used to be, it should be A, B, X, Y. And I wanted Y to be the thumb button, which is row two, button one. So I just went in here and just simply changed that. And then of course I made the A and the B button or uh, the equivalent of button one and button two, block and steal. And the great thing is, is once you escape out of this, it automatically saves those uh, per game overrides and you're ready to go. So that concludes this video and the series on mapping controls for RetroArch. If you have any other ideas or things you'd like to see, I would love to hear them in the comments below. Uh, please subscribe and remember there's a lot more to come on how I built the ultimate 16 terabyte drive.